Hi, my name is Gerdy Verwoerd and you're listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. Today's guest is Gretchen Donnelly. Gretchen and I met when we were both participating in a course called Outdoor Intelligence for Online Coaching. A course, by the way, that is facilitated and designed by Fee McMillan, who was also a guest on this show. If you haven't heard the episode where I have a conversation with her, please go and check it out. It's a good one. This episode, though, is my conversation with Gretchen. I wanted to have this conversation because I was very impressed by Gretchen. He is a very experienced coach, has contributed greatly to the development of coaching, development and acceptance of coaching, I should say, uh, in Ireland. And he is very clear about what he wants to accomplish in his coaching practice. He wants to help people step into their power and work with the biggest challenges facing humanity, the climate, biodiversity and our environmental crises. So let me introduce Gretchen a bit more deeply to you. When he finished college, Gretchen went to Australia for a year and returned home 12 years later. In that time, he lived and worked in Taiwan for eight years, where he studied Chinese, taught English, and eventually set up his own business. He also traveled extensively in Southeast Asia and often did this for months at a time. In 1998, he returned to Ireland and he bought a training franchise, specializing in leadership and management development. Qualifying as an executive business coach in 2006 was a natural progression. Coaching also reignited his passion for learning, which was all but extinguished by his 17 years in the formal education system. In 2007, he attended his first coaching event, a talk by Sir John Whitmore, one of the founding fathers of coaching. Sir John articulated three provocations. Consumerism, more and more, is not compatible with sustainability. Quantitative technical advance is way ahead of qualitative wisdom, which means our technical capability is way beyond our wisdom in how to use that technology. And hierarchy is in decay and must be replaced by self-responsibility. Hearing these provocations articulated with such clarity lit a spark in Grattan which still burns today and is part of the way he coaches. Fundamental to the way he coaches, I should say. In 2010, after suffering burnout, mindfulness found him. Recognizing how beneficial mindfulness was for him personally, he joined Potential Project. With these global leaders in corporate mindfulness, over the next six years, Grattan trained mindfulness to thousands of people in organizations. He believes we all know there are better ways we could be living and working, better for our well-being, for our loved ones, our organizations, our communities and our planet if only we're not too busy to explore them. He invites his clients to step back from the business of their lives and identify what is truly important. He is most interested in working with people who want to be the best for the world. People who want to step up, step into their power and work with the biggest challenges facing humanity, the climate, biodiversity and environmental crises. People who want to contribute to a better world, not just for humanity, but also for the more than human world. As a regenerative leadership coach, he supports clients to do their own inner inner transformational work first. When they do, they are equipped for the challenges of working with these existential threats. He facilitates mission-driven teams and purpose-led organizations. He helps them develop and grow their collective wisdom and work in ways that contribute to the healing of the planet. He has pioneered walk and talk coaching sessions in nature for more than 10 years and virtual walk and talk sessions since the pandemic began. Integrating neuroscience, mindfulness and nature practices with indigenous wisdom opens people up to the different ways of sensing, feeling, thinking, doing and being. People are then supported to reimagine a better future and a more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Gretchen is an honorary Life Fellow and a founding council member of the Association for Coaching in Ireland and was chair of this organization from 2013 to 2015. He's an associate faculty member with the Irish Management Institute, teaching on their diploma in executive coaching. He's been trained in a diploma in coaching for performance in Dublin Business School since 2013 and he was a board member of Mindful Nation Ireland from 2018 to 2021. 
He's a member of the Climate Coaching Alliance and has protested with his daughter in many of the Fridays for Future Schools climate strikes. Now, if this is not an impressive introduction to a guest of mine, I don't know what is. So let's dive in to my conversation with Gretchen Donnelly. Gretchen, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Herty. I'm excited to be here today. Ah, good. That's uh, that's really great to, to hear. Um, you have quite the experience. Uh, I just read your bio, and um, there's quite a lot of experience in there when it comes to coaching, but also mindfulness is very important to you. Um, you started training in that in 2010, or you became certified in it uh, as a trainer, and uh, it's a big part of what you do and what you um i guess i could use the word train the people that you work with how does mindfulness for you connect with self-leadership um i think that's a that's a nice place to start because for me mindfulness is kind of the gateway to how we live our lives um certainly how I live my life and I know from years of working with clients the the thing that always gets in the way is the the inner stuff Mm -hmm. so you know so there's a phrase from Lao Tzu uh, which goes understanding others is intelligence understanding yourself is true wisdom Mm -hmm. mastering others is strength mastering yourself is true power so very often when i work with leaders and i train coaches as well i say i say forget about trying to understand anybody else because you know a lot of our lives we try to understand how others behave and why do they behave in that way and i say don't worry about that forget about that Mm -hmm. if you understand why you do what you do you will completely understand everybody else. And what I mean by that is, you know, the the way we behave is very often related to things that trigger us and so on and so on. And so we're not, you know, we're not rational human beings. Mm -hmm. We are rationalizing human beings. Yeah. So, So how is this then related to mindfulness? So I think what mindfulness does, it really helps us to get intimately familiar with how the mind is. And if we're completely honest about it, the mind is completely insane, you know, but we don't say that, you know, because we like to think we're reasonably sane and we're reasonably together and so on. Mm. And I'm endlessly fascinated by how you know, in that coaching space, what I'm really helping people to see uh, is their habit patterns, the habit patterns of the mind, the habit patterns of uh, things that they do that they know don't serve them well. Yeah. And, you know, and when I'm doing that, um, I'm I'm always learning about myself because I'm kind of going, oh, gosh, yeah. No wonder I understand this so well, because that's what I do all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So so I don't know. Does that answer your question? I think it is. Um, It does. What what I hear you say is that to be um, to be able to lead, you have to understand yourself. You have to. Be able to lead yourself. And to to lead others is to be able to lead yourself and to know others is to first know yourself. That's what I hear you say. Yeah. And I think that's so important because in the world we live in today, there's, there's very little room actually created or given for that introspection or you know, stepping back and thinking, recognizing what's triggering us. Yeah. So if I get if I get pissed off at somebody, mm-hmm. that's a really interesting learning point. That's yeah. really, you know, so 
when I uh, when I've worked with people in the past, um, there's usually usually I get along well with almost everyone, but then mm. there's always one person, and that person really creates a lot of, um, yeah, it, it. I can't say they create a lot of frustration or anger but uh, anger and frustration arise in me yes yeah, yeah, yeah and that's where it's really interesting because i start to recognize there's, there's something in them that that i see that probably is a reflection of me mm. yeah yeah that's true you make me think of something that happened to me well quite regularly, but that last week when I was guiding a group, it was a, a lovely group. We had a ball, but like, as just, and like you, I'm like, you know, 99% of the people you meet are perfectly nice people. Um, but there's always one person that stirs something up inside you. And just like you said, and uh, this guy, he was, he's perfectly nice. But there was something about him. And as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, hang on. That was what riled me a little bit. That was what I recognized in him without being necessarily conscious of it that I have some of those habits. And I don't particularly like those habits in myself. And I'm working on them, but I have not been completely successful yet. Yeah, yeah, and it's yeah, yeah and, and it's very easy to, to when you run into somebody like that to put it all on them and not look back at what you, um, as a person, have in characteristics, perhaps, or behaviors, or anything like that. Yeah, and I think that's a really nice way of putting it Hardy, because very often what we yeah what we want to do is we want to project our frustration or our anger or whatever it is onto the other person and say they're making me angry and actually it's not they make no you know, the anger is your yours as well it's actually from a mindfulness perspective, what we're really just inviting people to do is to recognize there is anger. Yeah. And and then then as I say, when there is anger or frustration or envy or jealousy, that's the juice. Yeah, that's information. Absolutely. But yeah. most of the time we run a mile from that stuff because we don't like it, because actually the finger is going to be pointing back at us. Yeah. So so if I if I give maybe if I give an example, because that can be helpful for people. Mm-hmm. Um so I have this phrase about myself that that, that uh, some others might recognize as well. But, you know, I'm completely flexible, but I'm absolutely rigid in my flexibility. <laughs> I think you might have heard me say that before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but what that actually means is, I you know, I'm really easygoing. But when somebody is not easygoing and, and flexible with me, mm-hmm. then I get really rigid and inflexible and pissed off and all of those things yeah and and I I I worked with this guy before and I'll just share this because this is also related to mindfulness so mindfulness is is the ability to be with everything and to allow space for everything and but to recognize in the moment what's actually going on from moment to moment. So I was standing on stage in in front of an audience delivering a presentation to about 150 people. Hmm. And uh, this guy who I worked with at the time, who I had a fractious relationship with, uh, he came into the... came in to the back of the room you know which I knew he was going to be doing at some stage or other Mm -hmm. but as I was standing on stage I as soon as I saw him I had this visceral reaction in my stomach Mm. and I I recognized in him there was something about the way my father used to look at me yeah And, and this is not to blame my father either by the way 
but it was just a visceral reaction in my stomach. Yeah. And I knew in that split second, in that instantaneous moment, that there was something about him that that triggered a subconscious memory of how my father used to look at me in a certain way. Yeah. And and that what was really and it was fascinating because I, I didn't falter at all. I completely I was in the moment, I was delivering. I didn't miss a beat, but I really was resonating with observing what was happening to me in the body. And I was I was really curious. Mm. And I think that for me is that word curiosity is what I always invite clients to do with, you know, the people I work with, whenever there's something that kind of triggers them, I go, now that's an invitation to be curious. Yes, I agree. I agree, and it's. Um, I'm in, I'm really impressed with you. You know, that's almost like two people being two people at the same time. You know, just doing your business, delivering whatever it is that you need to deliver, but also being able to observe yourself and think, "Ooh, interesting." I'm, and maybe you even thought I have to explore this further when I've got more time, or maybe it was just recognizing the fact that oh, this is what he triggers. This is why. This is part of the reason why we have this fractitious uh, relationship. Yeah, and and I think it 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 is really interesting because it brought a realization to me of what was actually happening very often in our relationship, mm -hmm. and and you know that was just one encounter in the relationship, but yeah, but yeah. It, it was. It was one that was so clear. Um, and actually, I think it was really helpful that I was on stage because if I wasn't on stage, I could have been just, if I had been in the audience and it had happened when, mm -hmm. when he came in, I probably wouldn't have noticed it or or I would have gone into, a, well, that bloody so-and-so and, -so and <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in my own yeah. mind and mm -hmm. got, gone into that pointing the finger of blame at him or whatever yeah. else. Yeah. So, yeah. It, and this is this is what for me self leadership then then becomes about. It's that exploration of what's actually happening yeah. for you internally, and being having that ability to manage yourself so that you're managing those triggers in a way that's really kind to yourself mm. because I think for me as I work with people as I've worked with people over the years I think the the most important thing that people can do when they get triggered in these type of situations is to be kind to themselves because it's very easy to blame yourself and say, oh, that's so stupid. And oh, my gosh, I, you know, why did I do that? And why do I keep doing it? Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, being kind to yourself gives you a bit of space. And it allows it's an invitation, really, just to embrace your humanity. Yeah. You know, so so so. You know, very often we we hold ourselves to very high standards, mm -hmm. and you know, I, I'm very often when I'm working with people, you know, you ask them the question, well, if a friend of yours did the same thing, what would you say? Yeah, you know, oh, I'd be really nice to them. Yeah, but when it's yourself, it's like, oh my God, you're such an idiot, or whatever it is. Yeah, true, and 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 so. So mindfulness is helping us to see all of these inner workings, these inner thoughts, not mm. just thoughts, but, you know, I think, I think mindfulness in, in a certain sense can get a bad rap nowadays because it's almost like wheeled out as a, as a panacea for everything. Yeah, it's like a, a almost a fashion statement. Yeah, and, and, and I think when you go deeper into mindfulness and you start to really appreciate what the practice is about um it's it's much deeper than just sitting there with your eyes closed and 
you know, breathing and yeah. paying attention to your breath. So a friend of mine who, who was a mindfulness teacher and was a Buddhist nun for eight years as well, mm. she says that bodyfulness is probably a better way of describing it mm. because you're, you know, like when I was on stage, that visceral reaction if I hadn't been aware of what was happening in me, I, you know, I could have, I could have had this sense of an unease and started stumbling or whatever, mm-hmm. or, you know, or losing my focus and, and then, you know, getting lost as I'm probably doing a little bit now. <laughs> um, but knowing what was, what was actually happening in that moment in my body yeah. And being able to observe the emotion that that was also related to that and then the thoughts that are related to it. And so, so you know, in the West, we talk about the mind and the body as if they're separate. Mm. And actually, you know, the, the, there's there's no there's no divide between the mind and the body. The mind and the body are the same thing. And. You know, in all Asian languages, the word for mindfulness and heartfulness are the same thing. Yeah. And and I think I think when we, you know, in the West, we tend to be so much in our minds. And we tend to think that everything happens in the mind. And actually we know you know when you're out in the mountains yeah there's so much happening around you in so many different ways and how we pick up on stuff you know it's kind of like that intuitive picking up oh don't go that path or don't make that step Mm -hmm. and you know this is not necessarily a cognitive thing but it's just something different i don't know does that resonate yeah yeah, yeah. it totally does you know um an example comes to mind when i was um i was hiking with a friend and we both had our dogs with us and we were walking through a meadow and in that meadow there was cattle and this cattle uh, cows had calves um you know when especially when you you have to be aware of cattle anyways when you're walking the mountains here in austria but especially when you've got dogs because dogs tend to make cattle on um uh, uh, skittish. Mm. So, um, and we were just talking, we were walking, walking along the path and not really paying attention to the cattle. And I don't know why, but something alerted me to, to something that was going on on my left hand side. And I look in that direction that is a cow coming towards me as if she's a, a bull in a Spanish arena. <laughs> Head down, full tilt, full, you know, just intent on you know on on crushing me basically so i raised my arms i shout at her uh and you know she stops but now the whole herd is um no longer just you know no longer um just grazing but uh, very intent on us on getting us out of the meadow now how we got out of that meadow is a completely different story but the fact that even though i was engrossed in conversation something to the left not she wasn't mooing or anything. She wasn't making a lot of noise. She was just hurtling herself towards me. Something made me glance to the left and see this cow coming towards me at full tilt. Now we got out of the, the meadow safely. We got our dogs out safely. So all of that went well. But yeah, you know, there is something that kicks in when you're out in nature, especially when you're out in nature, that is a little bit, I don't want to say dangerous, but you have to be a bit more aware of your surroundings than you would be Mm -hmm. in your back garden, for example. Yeah, something kicks in. You know, and in other areas as well. Sometimes you walk somewhere where you just suddenly think, oh, I'd better be paying attention to where I'm putting my feet because if I stumble around here, um, you know, I, sometimes I call them that that's an end of story drop. Yeah. You don't <laughs> want to do one of those. No. Nope. So, yeah, that happens. Um, 
And uh, and I uh, again, yeah, coming back to what you said earlier, um, the mind and the body being disconnected for so many people in the West. One of the things I think that that happens in nature, I know that happens in nature, especially when you spend more time in there, you know, preferably a little bit more than an hour or so. When you walk in nature long enough, what happens is that you drop out of your mind and into your body and your body starts to do what it is, has been designed to do. You know, and, and the thing, and, Everything it becomes one. You can. It's almost like your body starts uh, steering your mind, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and I think that's maybe a nice segue into talking about the mm. whole nature part as well. But just before you do, there was. There was, I, I think we're very fortunate in the West today to have the neuroscience because the neuroscience yeah. is helping us understand how the brain really works. And as you were talking about, about you know, that cow coming directly at you and, and, you know, just, you know, even though you may have been engrossed in the conversation with your friend, there was something that, you know, instantly picked up. Mm. And so... You know, from from a neuroscience perspective, what we know is that we're capable of processing at a cognitive level, processing about seven bits of information per second. Yeah. At a subconscious level, through all our senses, we are processing about 11 million bits of information per second. That's crazy, isn't it? And so when you think about that there, there's you know we're picking up what seven bits as opposed to 11 million bits mm. of information so all of that is coming in in so many ways that we don't completely understand or appreciate yes. and it's it's that evolution of you know we've spent millions of years evolving to become these human beings mm. and in a certain sense, we're not evolved to live in buildings and houses. We're evolved to live in the mountains and the jungle. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And, and, and so I, I love that way that you're describing as, you know, when, when you're in the mountains for a few days, the body and the mind really start to become the same thing, which they are all the time. Exactly. But but in 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 our own culture, we we get so caught up in our cognitive thinking, our cognitive way of seeing the world, mm. and you know we don't always appreciate how how many different intelligences we have, mm. and that we pick up on things in so many different ways. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And 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 then for me, so so you know I've been um, I qualified as a coach in two thousand and six, and I've always been curious, and you know so I'm I'm always pushing myself to try new things, and I guess probably you know sometime in two thousand and eight or nine or ten. Uh, you know, when I was coaching someone, I was sitting inside on a beautiful day, looking out the window, thinking, God, we should be outside. It's such a beautiful day. Why why aren't we outside? Mm. And, uh, you know, I can't say this is exactly how I started uh, walk and talk coaching, but but it's something like this. And I probably said to that person, shall we go out for a walk? Yeah. And. And that was how I, I began what I call my walk and talk coaching sessions. Mm. So now all my all my coaching sessions, I'd say 95% of them are uh, outdoors. Yeah. And, you know, so whether that is uh, face to face uh, or side by side, actually, rather yeah. than face to face mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, or virtually so by phone you know so a lot of the time um 
I walk out my front door and the client walks out their front door and we begin our coaching sessions, you know, as we go out into nature, wherever we are. Yeah. And, and over the years, I've, I've come to realize the impact of how the impact on, on, the clients I work with of the learning that they take, um, but also how they're much more relaxed. You know, it, it it going back to what you were talking about, where the mind and the body become much more connected. Yeah. So so the it's almost like their center of cognitive gravity mm. goes from a cognitive you know head place to a more centered stomach place. Mm. And and then they're much more connected. And, and we know from being, you know, we know the research around nature tells us we're much more relaxed. Yeah. We're much more creative. We're much better able to see different perspectives because when we're more relaxed, we're much we're much more capable of being yeah. flexible and so on. Yeah. Yeah, we're much more open to new possibilities. Always. Yeah, yeah. And and what I love about being out in nature with clients in this way is that it 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 invites them into a different way of being. Yeah. And you know, when I look back at, at you know of of for me sitting in a meeting room. Uh, as a way of coaching and and it does work and it is effective and so on Mm -hmm. Um, but when you're outside it's it's a completely different experience I agree I agree you go no it's just it's so much more liberating you know like you know, to go back to to some of the subconscious stuff, mm. if you're coaching, uh, you know, if you're coaching someone in their office or yeah. even if it's not their office, but their offices in one of the meeting rooms in their offices, mm-hmm. there are all these anchors there yeah. that that are keeping them stuck in, in the same place very often yeah. that they're not conscious of at all. And when you get out into nature, that there's, I mean, I can see it with clients. You know, they come and their shoulders are scrunched up because they're they might be rushing to get there, or yeah. or they might have just had a meeting and oh, you know, whatever's happening. Mm. Yeah. But they start to, they just start to relax. It's true. It's true. I just spent um, three weeks hiking in the mountains. Uh, I'm not quite sure when. This is being going going to go live this episode, but uh, you know we're recording this on August. What is it? The thirtieth, I think. Um, so I just spent three weeks in August, three consecutive weeks hiking with different people, and especially the last week, I had a group of seven people with me, and several of them commented on the fact that in, within this group we had conversations that we would never have had had we been somewhere else, simply because we were walking every day. And as you walk, part of it is, um, you know, you, you, you relax all the things that you just mentioned, but also the fact that you don't have to look each other in the eye. You don't have to look each other in the face all the time. It makes it really easy when people are a little bit open to it to go deep in conversations to places that you perhaps never even intended to go to, but apparently needed going to because it comes up in the conversation. Mm. And these were just, you know, these were, I, I was hiking a, uh, um, a track that was, that had nothing to do with coaching, but just the conversations went to places that were, it could have been coaching conversations if I wanted to make, if I had wanted to make them that. Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting because um, 
you know, very often the conversations just go where they need to go. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of brings to mind, there's a beautiful phrase from one of my favorite teachers, a woman called Nancy Klein, and mm-hmm. she's written about the thinking environment and time to think uh, is one of her books. More time to think is a, a, another one. Um, but she says the coach is completely essential and absolutely irrelevant. Yes. And And that, to me, then, there's something about presence in coaching. And when you're out in nature, it's it's much easier in a certain sense. Maybe easier isn't the right word, but you're much more connected in in a way that maybe you don't understand. And, And, you know, clients are much more connected to themselves and maybe then they go to the places that need healing Mm. because in my experience of working with people you know everything goes back to childhood stories and what's happened to them in childhood at some level or other yeah and and you know, we can call it trauma, even though it may not seem like trauma. Um, and maybe some people wouldn't even call it trauma. But but it's 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 like, you know, I gave that example of um, how how I saw in that man who walked into the back of the room, I saw an, an image of my father. Yeah. And my father had a way of looking at you and looking at me. Mm-hmm that uh uh, you know he didn't have to say anything he didn't have to say anything and it was just like oh my god yeah it was visceral and i think when you're out in nature we we there's something very healing about it yeah and we may not always realize it or we may not always connect with it in that way but it's it's like we come back after a walk or, well, how do you feel after three weeks in the mountains, apart from maybe being really tired? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, for me, the mountains are my happy space. Mm. So, you know, it's, yeah, I'm physically tired, but mentally, and, you know, I had, to, I had, what have I had? I have had something like, 18 people who I was responsible for to bring safely back. But other than that, you know, that's at the back of my mind, but I had as much fun as everybody else. And it's, I've never seen so much Edelweiss and I'm just, you know, I'm like, it's playtime and it's fun and it's beautiful. And I'm all inspired, even though I may have seen some of these mountains, I don't know how many times already, you know, it's always and to me, it feels like home. You were talking about how, or we were both talking about how we drop back into our bodies and how mind and body become one. And I can sort of go in almost into what in NLP they call um, third position, where you're sort of outside yourself and it's almost like you're looking at yourself. And I can be in that position and wonder why it is that my feet seem to know where they have to put themselves. It feels like home. And I'm born and raised in the Netherlands, you know, flat as a pancake. So I'm all, I'm amazing. Well known as well. Yeah. Very, very uh, devoid of them, actually. Mm. Yeah. So it's, Yeah, it's 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 this weird. It it, it is. Um, what is the phrase I use? Physical exercise, mental detox. Yeah, that's a that's a nice a nice way of putting it. All right. Yeah. And um, yeah, I remember my one of my profound nature experiences was. Um, I went trekking in the Him- Himalayas mm-hmm. and I'd never, I'd never been trekking anywhere before really, you know? And so I, I met this other Irish guy in Hong Kong. We were going to Nepal together and we were kind of saying, 
we wanted to go trekking. And so, you know, and we we started to talk to lots of different people about how do we do this? And some people would say, well, you have to get a guide, you have to get a Sherpa, you have to get a, you know, all of this equipment and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And then other people would say, well, no, it's very easy. You just go from, um, you know, these, these uh, tea houses to tea house and yeah. you have your rucksack and you can sleep in the tea houses along the way and so on. And so we kind of went, yeah, let's do the tea house. Yeah. And I remember going uh, into the mountains in, you know, the Himalayas and, oh, wow, just that sense of awe when you're in the mountains, that sense of, you know, and as you say, like, even though you may have seen it before, I'd never seen it before, mm. but, you know, I'm sure if I lived there all my life, uh, maybe it might be uh, have this sense of being a bit of wallpaper background yeah but there's something so magical about I remember waking up in the morning and and taking that first cup of tea outside and just sitting out watching the sunrise and just the beauty and I think what what actually what it it did for me um was it really made me realize how small and significant I am in in you know in in the greater scheme of things like yes. you know um and we trekked up to a place called Kalapatar which is uh over 18,000 feet mm. and it was absolutely magical and I've never felt better in my life in myself I've never you know I just I was you know I was younger 33 as I remember at the time and I just had such a ball yeah yeah it was, it was just well, amazing that's a good description of how it is what it's like to be among mountains I think it's I think it's it can feel like that in any magnificent grand bit of nature uh, it, uh, you know spaces like uh, probably the desert i've not i i've been to death valley but i've never been to any other death uh, uh, desert but i imagine it to be this big landscape flowing with sand and other you know and there's rocks and, and stuff like that uh, and the ocean as well i think the ocean the desert and mountains are three landscapes or seascapes that are so vast that suddenly you realize you're you know you're nothing but a speck we we, we were standing on um above a valley so we're on one side of the valley and across from us is the other side of the valley and we can see last week this was and we can see a trail on the side of the mountain and all of a sudden we see two tiny little figures moving along this trail and realize that or some of the group realized they were like "Ooh, if they are this tiny seem this tiny to us we must seem as tiny as to them and you see this huge mountain and these mountains where we were walking were nowhere near as huge as the mountains that you just mentioned but even then you realize the magnificence and for me it's also the majesty of the landscape and the insignificance of ourselves and when we and for me it also you know yes we all have problems i have my own problems and in a way, they seem much more, much less significant than they do when you sit in your house or in your office or wherever it is in civilization. And you think, oh, my God, this problem, it is so big. Because you have taken a step away from it or a few steps away from it and are able to look at it from a, a distance and see it from a different perspective. It's... I find it, and I've noticed that other people too find it not as not easy to put things into perspective when they're sitting with their nose on top of it. 
Sometimes you have to move away. Yeah. Would you like to do a little exercise? Oh, well, I may not keep it in the uh, in the recording, but yes, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a so 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 here's an invitation. So you you put your hand mm -hmm. in front of you, so your fingers are pointing straight up towards the sky. Yeah. And so you bring more or less the palm of your hand up to your about a half an inch from your nose. Mm -hmm. So, so how clearly can you see your hand at the moment? It's a bit foggy. Okay. So now put it about a foot away from your face. Mm -hmm. How clearly can you see it now? Yeah, I see it in sharp relief. So you can see it all? Yeah. So if you put it back up to your face, this is... This is, you know, this is life without mindfulness. Mm -hmm. This is life when you put it a foot away from your face. This is yeah. life with mindfulness. Like so that. we can see things much more clearly. Yeah. And so when we're, you know, when we have our hand in front of our face, this is almost like we fill our lives with busyness and so much stuff that we have to do. And and then so much of our thoughts are self-referential. You know, we're we're always thinking about ourselves. Mm. And and you know, and I I I often say to to um, classes that I'm teaching or clients I'm working with, you know, is, you know, we we like to think we're the center of the universe. But I've I've had empirical research carried out on my behalf, which proves beyond doubt that I am the actual center of the universe mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. So the rest of you don't need to worry about it. And, and I can share that research if you really, really want. Mm -hmm. So, but in a certain sense, it's, it's, you know, we, we, we get so caught up in our um, thoughts and all the thoughts are about how am I going to do this and what's, you know, and, and so, so when we get out into nature, that expands our perspective. Yes, it does. And and in a certain sense, you know, even as I'm saying that, the gestures of my hands are are expanding out from the heart. Yeah. And this is what mindfulness is doing. We're we're connecting in a much more heartful way with nature, with the world. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 in a certain sense, this is. This is how we're going to heal the world. At yes. least this is my sense of it. I agree. I agree. It's, it's the um, it's the reconnecting ourselves with that part of ourselves that that we have lost the connection with, which is the the knowledge and the experience of being connected with nature. We are part of nature. Um, and when you talk about healing, it's not just that we're healing ourselves um, when we do that. We are also healing the world, the planet. And I know that's a really big thing for you. Uh, that's, that's, that's something yeah. you're deeply interested in and deeply passionate about. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting as you're saying that, I'm really feeling a visceral reaction in my body. Mm. And and I you know I'm noticing a very strong emotion in 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 my body, and so there's a cer there's certainly energy around when you when you speak to that healing of the world, and you know one of my favorite teachers is is around this is Thomas Hubel, mm -hmm. and he talks about collective healing from trauma, and. Um, in 2019, he did this, I, he did a collective healing from trauma summit, and they had 56,000 people participate. Last year in September, they had 108,000 people participate in the same summit. And this year, it's happening in September. I'm really curious to see how many people they will have mm. this year. And in a certain sense, I have this. Um, kind of intuitive feeling that to heal our relationship with the world, to 
work with the climate crisis that we're facing, the biodiversity, the environmental crisis that we're facing, is is really healing work. And and as Thomas Hubel says, when I heal, the world heals. And and in you know in the way that I work with clients when when they are kinder to themselves because the main outcome of my coaching i would say is that people are kinder to themselves mm. so then they're more connected to themselves they're more connected to others they're more connected to nature and as they heal the world heals yeah and i think there's a certain beauty in that and and I think when we start to really, truly reconnect with nature in the way that we, we, you know, our modern society doesn't really, I won't say allow, but doesn't invite us into. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when we deliberately create ways to connect with nature, um, that's the healing that we need to work with the climate crisis. Yeah, I agree. You know, and and because if we fall, you know, for me, it's about falling in love with nature all over again. Because if we have that love of nature, we can't continue to treat it as if it's, you know, something that we can just, you know, another commodity. Exactly. Yeah. I I could excuse me. I couldn't agree more. You know, it's. All the things you talk about when it comes to walk and talk, you know, it's I completely agree. And for me, the it's almost like an added benefit. It's something that um, it's like a, a, an intention of mine underneath the reason why I bring people. You know, the whole it's easier to talk when you walk, and it's it's you're more relaxed. Bringing people into nature and reconnecting them with that part of themselves that they may not consciously know, but their subconscious knows. Oh, this is where we belong. We are part of this environment. It's For me, it's rekindling the thing that they probably had when they were a kid, because we all know little kids that, you know, that sit on their haunches for a long time just looking at an earthworm or something or a flower or whatever it is that they're fascinated by. When we can rekindle that fascination and that awe that you talked about as well, I strongly believe you cannot go home after having experienced that. And I don't care if it's in the mountains or in the park around the corner. You cannot go home, excuse me, and not think, oh, I have to protect this somehow. I have to care for this somehow. And when you care about something, you want to protect it. You want to maintain it or make it even better. Yeah. And I think that's, in a certain sense, it's very simple how to solve the the, the climate crisis is by helping people get reconnect with what's our birthright, if you wish, Mm. what's within us. Um, because when we have that connection with nature, we, we're just much more at home in ourselves. We we take ourselves out of, you know, I am the center of the universe to, oh my gosh, I'm just a little speck on this earth. I am part of instead of I am. Yeah. Well, I, I love the phrase, I'm not part of nature. Sorry, we're not part, we're not a part, a part. of nature. We're not a part of nature. We are nature. Yeah, it's, that's even better. That's true. That is true. And I think that's where the disconnection is, in the Western society anyways. We have, as Western society, sort of, we think we have severed that connection. And that's why we live from our shoulders up instead of with our entire body. Because as soon as you start walking in nature, I was talking about how I sometimes look at myself from a third position and think, oh, that's funny. How does my body know what to do? 
when I'm walking through landscape where you have to put your, you know, minds where you put your feet. But our bodies are designed to do that. The body of a human being is designed to walk. And like a kid, when you've not done it for a long time or you've only walked on pavement for a long time, you have to get used again to letting your body decide where they put where it puts your feet when you walk on a surface that's other than pavement but when you do it more often you'll find it knows what to do because that's what it was built for yeah i completely agree or the um i remember after after I, the first trek I did in the Himalayas was I did the Everest base camp and then I came out a different route. But I remember after three weeks, four weeks of hiking, I was like a mountain goat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you just know where to put your feet and you go, you walk across boulder fields. Mm. I won't say as if it is pavement, but a lot, you know, it, a lot easier than you ever imagined possible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I want to be conscious of our time together um, and ask you the three questions that I ask all my clients, all my guests. I was going to say all my clients, but all my guests. And that is, could you, can you give me a favorite piece of music, a favorite book, and a favorite movie that celebrates nature? Um, <clears throat> well, my favorite book, um, I, you know, and I've, I'm, I'm very much a person of the recency effect, you know, what I've read quite recently or mm. often comes to mind the easiest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay. But it's not a novel, but it's Braiding Sweetgrass. I have to read this book. I've not come around to it, but you're, I think, number three or something that mentioned this. Yeah, it, it's a really, it's a book that reconnects us in a different way with nature. Mm. And it's it's written by this, uh, um, I can't remember how, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, but she's a, a botanist and a professor mm -hmm. of, of, you know, in, in this space. And the way she writes is just beautiful. And there's, so she combines because she's, she's um, uh, partly Irish, partly, I think, Italian, but also partly indigenous American and, mm. you know, Native American. And she draws on the, the 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 indigenous wisdom and and it's a really powerful book it's okay. it's a it's a it's a real work of beauty i just loved it mm. you've convinced me you know when we yeah. sign off I'm, I'm gonna go and get it yeah and uh, it is on audible so if you like listening and it's narrated by her so mm. i think that really you know, when I when I listen to Audible, I always look to see if the author is the narrator as well, because mm -hmm. if the author isn't the narrator, it's not always as connecting or as connected. Mm -hmm. um, music. Um, I'm known in my family. I'm known to be a bit quirky. So I, I remember I went to Canada uh, on on a trip. Uh, many years ago, probably 1992, but I went to a place called Coal Lake. I had some friends, which is in the middle or out, out in the middle of nowhere in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, um, I remember my friend took me out on the lake in, in a boat and it was in the, you know, early evening or, you know, moving into the dusk period. And the sound of the loons mm -hmm. on the lake was just extraordinary. So I came home with this tape and listened to the loons. And my, my family then thought I was a bit of a loon. But <laughs> it was just, I you know, and I can still, 
I don't have the tape anymore. Uh, well, I probably do. It's upstairs, but 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 you know you can you can YouTube listen to the loons, and you can you can just listen to the sound of the loons, and oh my goodness, that's you know there is there's something really beautiful about that. It's it is like. Uh, yeah, it's just like being there. It, it brings me back. It always brings me back to that time and place. And yeah, it just has this sense of being connected and calm and tranquility and beauty, everything. Um, and the movie, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can, I can't really place any movies. Um, like I, I, as a child, I always watched nature programs mm. and that was what connected me. I just loved nature programs. I, I you know, I, I, there was just something about when I watched nature programs and, you know, like obviously uh, I think boys are always attracted to lions and, you know. Not just boys. Not yeah. just boys, yes, but. I understand. Right. Yeah. yeah, but uh, I remember when we were in South Africa, and you know, um, I was there with my my wife or girlfriend at the time, and um, we were in Kruger National Park, and I remember we, we we could see these lions, but they were lying on the ground, so all we could see was this flicking of a tail. Yeah, yeah. And and every five minutes, you know, a lion would get up and stretch, and it was like, oh my god. And my wife is kind of going, okay, well, we've been here now for half an hour. We haven't really seen anything. I'm going, no, this is amazing. This is amazing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, thank you. Thank you. There, um, one final question. Is there something that you do on a regular basis that helps you connect with nature and that helps you in your mindfulness, perhaps, or your self leadership? That is, something that the listeners can easily do to help them reconnect with those things, with those parts of themselves? Well, one of the things I do is I, I meditate outside in the garden. Mm. And, you know, and part of it is doing it with my eyes closed. Yeah. And then maybe the second part of it is doing it with my eyes open. And it's, you know, so the my as the mind calms down, then it's just opening up to what's right here in front of us. Mm. And you know, I just shared this final final thing, my KPI from coaching, yeah. you know. So 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 um I'm not a big fan of KPIs, but I, I use this as as my key performance indicator of coaching yes. is when, when I have a client and they have a nettle mm -hmm. and they're holding the nettle up to the sunlight and they are going, oh, my goodness, is that not amazing or what? That's when I know my coaching has been successful. I like it. On that note. Gretchen, thank you so much for being here. Well, it's my pleasure, Herdy, and thank you so much for inviting me. And I think I might have to come to the mountains someday and be guided by you. I'd love it. I'd love it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to Daring Self Leadership and the Nature Connection. You can find the show notes for this episode and every other one on the podcast page on the Dare Greatly Coaching website. The podcast is available wherever you like to listen and it's hosted by me, Gerdy Verwoerd. The music is Butt Bursting by Poddington Bear. Thank you for being with me today. I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. And in the meantime, as always, go Dare Greatly.